What a great picture to open the course with. That's an untreated basal cell carcinoma. Why in the world people wait so long? This guy came down from the hills of Tennessee and didn't believe in medicine, and it was way too late. He passed away shortly after this was taken. It spread to his brain and lungs and all sorts of stuff. So, all right, spring 2020, here we go. Now, I created this class from scratch. There was no PowerPoint slides when I took this over. So uh, this is, if I had to buy one book, it would be this uh, Bologna Dermatology. It's fairly expensive. Uh, there, Here are the other books I used to create this class. Fitzpatrick and Habif are both good as well. If I had the money, this is about $600. This is the ultimate evidence-based Rooks textbook of dermatology is awesome. Used to be able to see some of it for free on Google Books. I don't think they let you do that anymore. Nevertheless, that's how the courses was built. You're familiar with uh, June Kiera here. Uh, another histology book which I like better is Ross, which is the medical board book. This is the chiropractic board book. So, all right, let's start. So the skin, let's refresh your anatomy on the skin. It's also called the integument cutaneous membrane, cutaneous layer. It's the largest single layer or a single organ of the body. Of course, it's composed of the epidermis and dermis, two layers. I do like this question, embryology days, right? Uh, interestingly, the epidermis is derived from ectoderm, while the dermis is derived from sclerotomes, depending how deep you get it, specifically from sclerotomes. Uh, but for mesoderm, of course, sclerotome comes from mesoderm, so the board question could be either one of those things. It has, the dermis has nerves and blood vessels. The epidermis does it, no nerves and blood vessels. The dermis has two layers, a papillary layer and a reticular layer, which is deep to that. There's some controversy about a third layer of skin. Well, the third layer down is definitely the hypodermis, a.k.a. subcutaneous membrane, a.k.a. subcutaneous tissue, a.k.a. subcutis layer, a.k.a. panniculus, a.k.a. gross anatomy term, superficial fascia. They're all a.k.a.s for this hypodermis, this third layer down. Um, it is a loose connective tissue. It contains fat. It's underneath the dermis. Uh, it binds very loosely to the dermis. You can pull it apart when you're doing cadavers. It pulls apart really easy. There's no interdigitation system like is between the epidermis and dermis. There are no hemidesmosomes here. Now, some authors uh, include the hypodermis as the third layer of skin. Many authors do, but uh, June Kira, which is a board of chiropractic examiner, reference book. That's where questions will come from. It says it's not part of the skin. Um, so we will not include it as part of the skin in this class. And here, you're familiar with the epidermis is here on the top. And then we have the dermis, two layers, papillary layer. It's got these papillae right here, these little kind of finger-like projections. We'll look at those in a second. Hemidesmosomes are, you can't see them, but they're all over the place. Underneath the papillary layers, the reticular layer, and then we have the third layer down is the hypodermis, or subcutaneous layer. There are two types of skin. There are hirsute skin, which is hairy, and there's glabrous skin, which is not. Like, what's not hairy? Well, the palms of your hands and the soles of your feet, that's glabrous skin. And the thickness of the epidermis is used to make the determination specifically whether or not there is a stratum lucidium. Remember from your histology days, stratum lucidium is only seen in glabrous skin, not seen in hirsute skin. So that's a way to tell them apart. Hirsute skin, hairy, right? That's how I remember that. Uh, that's by far the most common. There's more miles of that or cubic centimeters of that on your body than anywhere else. We don't really care about how thick it is. Glabber skin is thick skin, contains no hair, palms, and soles. We already said that. Uh, it has two extra layers, depending on which textbook you read. It definitely has a stratum lucidium. 
and that's the way you classify it. So if you're talking about globular skin, there's five layers. If you're talking about hirsute skin, there's only four layers of skin. This stratum, um, two extra stratum granulosa, and that's wrong. That should not be in there. So I'll have to take that out if I could remember to take number 12 out. It's a stratum, we'll go with stratum lucidium. There's another weird layer I will talk about here in a second. Uh, it has sweat glands, it still has sweat glands like hair suit skin, uh, and it's thick. All right, let's talk about the epidermis. This is the outermost layer of skin again, completely avascular. It receives nutrients via diffusion from the blood vessels that live in the dermis. Histology days, what is it made out of? Keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. Stratified means there's more than one layer, so there's like four to six layers of really flat cells, bags of keratin basically, uh, with wax kind of surrounding them, waxy layer, and all the organelles are dead by this, by this point. The epidermis is anchored very firmly to the epidermis, specifically to the papillary layer of the dermis. Thank you very much. Um, don't show this message again. Why that comes up sometimes and other, not others, I don't know. Uh, but yep, so it's anchored down into the, uh, what was I saying? So it's anchored firmly into the papillary of the dermis uh, via some kind of macroscopic connections, dermal papillae, which come from the papillary layer, meet little indentations called epidermal pegs or epidermal re, uh, ridges or reet pegs or reet ridges. So all AKAs for that. And then on the dermal papillae, you have these little hemidesmosomes, which are really what do the anchoring. We're actually going to look at those in a minute. So if you're able, I mean, it's almost impossible to rip the epidermis from the dermis, but if you could, you would get this little setup here. And you can see we have some macroscopic little epidermal pegs that fit in between these dermal papillae. The dermal papillae fit right into there. And there's hemidesmosomes which tie those down. And we need to look at these hemidesmosomes. So they're kind of like a rivet. Everybody knows what a rivet looks like this. And it's got a rivet shaft. Uh, and you, you put it like a piece of metal here and another piece of metal here. You have holes in the metal. And then you smash this flat and it holds the metal together. So it's kind of a hemidesmosome and a desmosome for that matter is kind of like a rivet. Uh, only thing is there's many shafts coming down into the dermis, right? Those are made of laminum five. This rivet head is called a plaque. And this whole thing right here, this is a basal cell in the stratum basale. Right, that's where this is all cytosol here. And remember, there's a cytoskeleton which is made up of keratin filaments. Keratin filaments combine together to, fo to form tonofilaments. And we'll look at what holds those together in a second. But the key that I want you to actually know is a protein here. And there's actually a urban and plectin. We won't get that deep, but I want you to know this one right here. BP-230. BP-230 are these blue things. BP-230 is what holds the cytoskeleton, the keratin filaments, into the rivet head or into the plaque. And why in the world would I want you to make that? And I know, oh my God, Dr. Jillard, oh, this stuff. Why do we have to know this stuff? We're going to be chiropractors. Gross picture warning. Well, who cares about it? This baby and the mom probably care. The mom probably cares about why the baby looks like this and is very high. This is severely, this condition is really severely affecting this child. And a child could die from this. This is an autoimmune attack against one thing in the body, and that's BP-230. And of course, it's got a name uh, that is called bullous pemphigoid. It's the most common autoimmune blistering disease of the skin, period. There's other blistering diseases 
This is the most common, so let's fall down the rabbit hole and talk about it. So we get an autoimmune attack against the BP-230. We can't see the pretty blue beads anymore because the body is attacking it. And we have an inflammation, an exudate. And these struts break loose, and now there's nothing holding the epidermis to the dermis, and swelling fills up, and you get these giant blisters that are secondary to the inflammatory exudate from this autoimmune attack. And that is the story with that. It has different presentations. Uh, it comes in waves. It can attack and then dry up and then attack again. Um, this is what it looks like. And bullus pemphigoid, some AKAs, pemphigoid, leave off the bullus. Bullus means bulla, which are big giant blisters. Confusingly, there is a more deadly type of blistering disease, but it's more rare. And this is called pemphigoid or pemphigus vulgaris. I remember it as the pole vault or PV, pole vault or pemphigus vulgaris. This one is deadly. It's more rare, though. So I actually took the slides out because I ne I mean, I could spend a four-hour a week class talking about dermatology. There's so many skin conditions. I have so many. I have enough for probably three class, three quarters right in a row of slides. Um, but bolus pemphigoid is not typically as fatal. It can be f fatal, but it's not as bad. Typically shows up in people who are older. Uh, What's one of the first signs that you might have bullus pemphigoid coming? It usually starts out as urticaria or hives. So this patient has hives. And for six months, year, uh, year and a half, two years, that's all that presents is hives. They come and they stay for a long time and then they go away. And then pretty soon they start getting lesions and the dermatologist is able to figure out, okay. I mean, you can do blood tests and look for the antibody for it. Um, but it typically starts out as hives. There's usually a long delay, up to usually about 12 months if you have good medical care to figure out what the heck is causing these things. Uh, most common site of infection is the abdomen and the groin, the flexor surfaces, the arms, the legs. Another concept is uh, Hansen sign and Nikolsky sign. Uh, so these patients are usually Hansen sign negative. So you probably don't know what Hansen sign is. So if you have a blister and you push your thumb into the blister, not like crazy hard to, to pop it, but push it in pretty firmly and watch the edges of the blister, the blister should not grow in diameter before your eyes. It shouldn't get bigger. If it does, that's a positive Hansen sign. So people with bullous pemphigoid, they usually don't. You push on the blister and nothing happens around the edges. It doesn't get bigger. It might pop, but it doesn't get bigger. Uh, people with pemphigus vulgaris, because that's an autoimmune attack against desmosomes. Okay, bullous pemphigoid is against hemidesmosomes. Pemphigus, the pole vault, or PV, is against desmosomes, and they are ubiquitous. Those things are everywhere. So it's a much more serious condition. And they do have a positive Hansen sign. Nikolsky sign in bullous pemphigoid is also negative. Uh, what is Nikolsky sign? Instead of pushing on the blister, right next to the blister, you start rubbing your finger back and forth and back and forth and, see, and do like a friction massage uh, next to the blister. And if you do that in someone with bullous pemphigoid, nothing will happen. If you do that, in the pole volter, the pemphigus vulgaris, the blister will actually migrate into the area that you're rubbing. You can make the blister bigger by doing that. That would be a positive Nikolsky sign. Got it? I think that's new stuff for you. Uh, so positive Hansen and Nikolsky signs are typically seen in pemphigus vulgaris. Right? And that's a autoimmune attack against desmosomes. A negative Hansen's and Nikolsky sign is typically seen in bullus pemphigoid. Or if someone just has urticaria and they have a big bulla and you do that, that's going to be negative Hansen and Nikolsky sign as well. So it's not just, it's any type of bulla. You can try that and it better not get any bigger. If it does, that's a problem. 
some fun facts. Uh, you can use immunofluorescence to make the diagnosis. In children, the first attacks usually go away, but they come back and they come again and they come back. Uh, it's, it is a permanent disease. You don't get rid of this uh, disease typically. Uh, the treatment is first as, geez, probably every single dermatological condition, condition I'm going to talk about, the first treatment is corticosteroids. Uh, and you can start with an ointment and you can rub it on the lesion and see if that cuts the inflammation. If that doesn't work, you can go with systemic like a prednisone. Uh, you might need an antibiotic because they can get infected. And the people who die usually get septicemia from an infection. So you have to be careful. There's a daprosone that they prescribe as an antibiotic that works well with it. Okay, let's look at the layers of the skin. Stratum corneum is the top layer. It's also called, called the horny layer. Uh, it's made of corneocytes or squames. Squames is another word. Those are the cells. Uh, these cells are dead. They All the nuclei is gone. The mitochondria is gone. The ribosomes. Uh, they're basically bags, flat bags of keratin filaments which have turned sideways. A whole bunch of keratin tonal filaments that have hooked together. Multiple keratin uh, makes tonal filaments or uh, what's the other cyto one? I've got a slide on it coming. Uh, and then they have filaggrin is proteins that hold the strands of keratin together. There's also a lot of wax around the cells, which helps form the water barrier of your skin. Right? Uh, they do have tight junctions at this point, but that's about the only thing uh, that is normal. A stratum lucidium is only seen in glabrous skin, and that's confirmed by your board book, June Kira and Ross. The uh, carotinocytes have already lost most of the organelles, so they're getting pretty flat looking, and they're see through. The filaggrin hasn't clumped all the, all the strands of collagen together, so therefore they're more see through yet. It's still kind of in the clumping process. All right, um, some consider it a, just a subdivision of the stratum corneum, um, but yet I want to make sure you know that name. Uh, the next layer down is the stratum granulosum, also called the granular layer, three to five cell layer thick. Uh, these cells are starting to die, starting to undergo terminal differentiation, which is a nice way to say they're dying, they're losing their nucleus, they're losing their mitochondria. Uh, the flagrin is ramping up, though. There's a lot of flagrin uh, protein around, which is vital to make your skin strong. In fact, some of the diseases we look at are mutations with the flagrin gene. Without the flagrin gene, you can't clump uh, the collagen filaments together and you get a skin that's really easily penetrated by bugs. It's not very not very tough. Uh, it also stratum granulosum contains a very important creature called uh, lamellar granules. Lamellar granules uh, these are what make the whip, the lipid layer that is secreted and it surrounds the cell. It's almost like another cell membrane around these uh, stratum granulosum cells. And it's waterproof. So that's, that's, you hear about the barrier function of the skin. It's all about the lipids that are created by these lamellar granules. And it's all about filaggrin, having enough filaggrin to clump the collagen fibers to make it a strong barrier. All right, here's just a little cartoon. Uh, you can see there's a strand of keratin there. Here's another strand of keratin, and they are hooked together by these flagrin molecules. You could call these tonal filament then. This is a tonal filament, which is just multiple keratin molecules hooked together. There's other ones. This lipid layer has been secreted out here. The lipid is bound to the cell by this uh, involucrin. It's another protein that's created. We're getting a little deep into this stuff, though, so we don't need to go that deep. Okay, the next layer down is a little confusing. This is stratum spinosum. 
This is the spinous or prickle cell layer made of spiny or prickle cells, they're called. This is normally the thickest. There is some confusion about around this layer now with a word, with a so-called layer called stratum germinativum. So June Kiera, which is your board book, uh, it says that usually basal cells, we haven't gotten to that layer, but that's the lowest layer. Basal cells are usually in the basal layer. But sometimes basal cells break off their basement membrane and they float and they can be seen in the stratum spinosum, the bottom of the stratum spinosum layer. And if they are, some authors like June Kiera give it a new layer, a new name, and they call it the stratum germinativum. Ross, the medical book, which I trust maybe a little more. I like both these books, so you read both of them, you get the story pretty good. But Ross says the stratum germinativum is simply an AKA for stratum basale. So he doesn't go on to mention this. So we'll go with uh, June Kira. So it's an additional layer, which means the basal cells have broken loose and are floating up a little higher. Okay, the stratum basale is, of course, the deepest layer. It's made up of stem cells called basal cells. Uh, they're normally attached to a basement membrane. Uh, the, this, they have hemidesmosomes, which anchor in to the dermis below. Right, we just looked at that. They consist of a, we said that, single layer of stem cells. Now, these basal cells are the key of life. All the other cells, the, the cells, the spiny cells and the granular cells uh, and the squames, they're all the same thing. They're, they were a basal cell that split via mitosis. Uh, when a basal cell splits via mitosis, it recreates itself, right? Because that destroys the cell. It's splitting in half. Recreates itself, and it creates a new cell called a carotenocyte. And then the process happens again. Uh, so here's, oh God, here we go, my drawing ability. Um, so it splits. It creates a new basal cell, and it now it created a new cell called a carotenocyte. It's going to be in the spiny layer here in a second, but the process happens again, and it gets pushed up, and it happens again, and it gets pushed up, and see these cells are pushed up and up and up. So all of the cells that we, the cell layers we talk about, they all were once a basal cell, and they have just underwent cell differentiation. So here's a cartoon, stratum basale is all basal cells here. Uh, we got a Langerhan cell here, it's an immunosurveillance cell, it's phagocytic. And uh, we'll look at that, there's a Merkel tactile, looks like uh, set up there for touch. Anyway, stratum spinosum and stratum granulosum. This is globular skin, right, stratum lucidium. And then there's the stratum corneum, see how they get flat? See how they've lost their organelles? You guys know that. The intermediate filaments versus tonal filaments. I kind of talked about this. Uh, as the carotenocytes differentiate and move up, they get filled with more and more intermediate filaments. You could call them keratin filaments because they're made of keratin. And those eventually they start getting joined together into really thick, double layered and triple and quadrupled and form cable-like structures, uh, which are called tonofilaments or cytokeratins. Those are kind of AKAs for each other. That was always confusing when I went through histology. Uh, meet the cells. So we have uh, the epidermis is made up of keratinocytes mainly. Uh, the, that's the most common type. It's not the only type of cell. We just looked at a Langerham cell, so there are more. But carotinocytes are bar four, uh, by far the most common carotinocytes. Uh, and yeah, who are the carotinocytes? Well, they're the corneocytes, the granulocytes, the prickle cells, the prickly, spiny cells. That's just AKs. They're just in different stages of maturation. There's three other less abundant cell types. There's melanocytes. We need to talk about those guys in a second. We'll talk about them. They're, they're, they're a little, little octopus, a little octopi. Langerhan are the immune cells. They're, they're sentinel cells. They're phagocytic. Uh, they can gobble up an antigen and present it, antigen-presenting cells. 
the Merkel cells uh, are for touch. They're sensory receptors. I'm not going to get I'm sure Dr. Doe burned that into your brains. Melanocytes I do like. That's my domain because if it becomes mutated and develop and s starts becoming immortal and divides too rapidly, that's melanoma. That's the most deadly type of skin cancer. So melanocytes live usually in the stratum basale normally. Its job is to inject neighboring cells with melanin. You can see its little octopus tentacles here are injecting all these cells. And this melanin will form a cap and protect the cell from UV radiation from Mr. Sun up here. Amazing drawer. Um, yeah. The, what's the greatest irony about these these selfish or selfishlessness melanocytes? Why the committee did this, I don't know why. There is no protection over the melanocyte. He has no, he doesn't inject himself. So therefore, they're susceptible to, to UV radiation. And unfortunately, UVA radiation can flip the gene on here that's not supposed to be and that turns off apoptosis, and the cell becomes immortal and mutated, and it doesn't die, and that's cancer, and that's malignant melanoma. So I don't know what the committee was thinking on that one. We're going to burn this picture into your brain. If you ever see a lesion like this on the skin, it's going to be bigger than the racer on a pencil, number two pencil at six millimeters. Uh, it's going to be variegated. See the different colors it's going to have irregular border borders. You can't fold it in half. This is deadly, deadly cancer. The trouble is seborrheic keratosis and some type of moles, they can look just like it, and we'll try to differentiate those as we go through the course. How about that one? Nope, this one's actually seborrheic keratosis. But as far as you're concerned, I mean, if, if it breaks the ABCs, and I don't want to get into that now, but we'll get into the ABCs. If it breaks the ABCs, it's your duty, if you don't want to get sued, that is, it, it's your duty to refer this out. Okay, um, that looks like melanoma, but it's not. These little bubbles, melanoma doesn't have these little bubbles, typically. That's the giveaway there for that one. So carotinocytes make up 95% of the epidermis. They're created by basal cells, which live in the deepest layer of the epidermis. We said that already. Um, they're born by, via mitosis. We said that. They're split. Everything I already said about that. I already said everything about this. This is the conveyor belt. The basal cells are splitting by mitosis. Here one just split, recreated itself, and it created a carotinocyte. And it's a spiny cell. And as it matures, it becomes a granular cell. And then a corny, uh, in the stratum corneum up here. We already went over that concept. There's just another nice cartoon showing the hemidesmosomes down here. Right? Lots of hemidesmosomes anchored very tightly uh, into, the, into the dermis. Okay, we already said this as well, too. So they flatten as they go up. They become filled with more and more keratin. You could say that these cells are uh, undergo keratinization as they go up. They become filled with more filaggrin, uh, more lamellar granules, which are the ones that produce the wax. Okay, what's the ultimate fate of carotinocytes? They die, and they slough off. You ever notice, you haven't probably dusted some of you, are not great dusters probably, and you'd see a bunch of dust. That dust is mostly made up of dead skin cells that have, uh, I mean, they're they're microscopic. Some of the particles that break off and they float through the air, and they can, they can make dust. They can also get into your mattress. They can go right through your sheets and right through your mattress, and they can accumulate uh, in your mattress. And there is a creature that will clean these up for you if you don't want to dust. At least it'll clean it up in your mattress, and those are called dust mites, and that's a big area of research right now. There's an electron microscopic view of some dust mites in a mattress that was cut open, and yeah, there they are. And some people 
have are allergic to these. And dust mites can get on your body and they can live. You have hair. They can uh, go down there. They can go down into the pores. And you can develop a autoimmune reaction. Your body says, oh my God, there's an invader. Let's attack it. And you get an inflammation and you get some type of eczema. And maybe the answer is that you have dust mites. And we'll talk more about that when the time comes. What's the turnover rate for a normal carotinocyte? About every 23 days. Uh, so it's born and 23 days later it sloughs off and feeds the dust mites. There's some diseases, however, that can greatly speed this up. And this is a really, really common one, psoriasis. And there's, I, I bet everybody in the class, I bet you know somebody with psoriasis. It's fairly common. I know plenty of students who have this and had this, who've been going through the program. Some not so bad, uh, some kind of bad. This guy's got it pretty bad. You don't have to have it this bad, though. Uh, it's thought to be autoimmune disease, not 100% understood. Uh, it is subject to remission and relapse, so it can clear up and it can come back. There's some triggers for this condition. 2% uh, of the population has it. Uh, genetically, if both parents have the gene for it, the gene mutation, you got about a 50-50 chance, 41% chance. American Indians, for whatever reason, they don't get it. It's very, really, really rare in American Indians. Uh, it is a lifelong autoimmune disease. There's no cure for it. Uh, and in and of itself, it can be associated with other types of autoimmune disease. But the psoriasis in and of itself, it usually doesn't get infected uh, and it's not deadly. It's not going to shorten your life. However, you've heard the term heartbreak of psoriasis before. It can be really emotionally devastating, especially if you get it bad like this poor girl. Um, I mean, that would just suck. That's a lifelong condition. And you can treat it, maybe get some of the redness. And she's treating it. She's got the whiteness out of it. There's white kind of a crust that can develop sometime, but it can really uh, be devastating. It's tough to, to live like that, especially kids uh, you know, your age or younger, teenagers. Um, what else? So some of the triggers, environmental, a bacterial infection can trigger an outbreak. Stress can trigger an outbreak. Trauma, drugs, uh, emotional stress. About 40% of the adults are affected by a, a, a strong bout of emotion will br bring on an attack. And uh, it, it sometimes pops up in kids after a streptococcal pharyngitis, after just kind of sore throat. It can pop up for the first time. Um, it is an out-of-control inflammation process. We said that it can attack the, we'll look at psoriatic arthritis somewhere in this course, but it can definitely get into about 17% 17, 17 of the people with psoriasis uh, have psoriatic arthritis on top of it, and that's a devastating arthritis. And the treatment is more heavy-duty tumor necrosis, uh, tumor necrosis factor alpha blocking agents the big one, probably most effective, is the methotrexate. Been around for quite a while now. There's some side effects, but um, what are you going to do if you look like that? You got to try to do something, right? Uh, heartbreak of psoriasis, really emotion. We we talked about that. How how horrible that is. Uh, the lesions typically are red. Uh, they're they're papules. Or they're not, they can start out as papules, uh, but they usually coalesce into something called a plaque. And we'll talk about the language of dermatology, or you can watch it if you want to get ahead. It's on YouTube now. You can watch it from last quarter. I'm keeping the slides basically the same uh, because I'm not sure which. You know, I'd prefer you watch these new slides, but if something goes wrong with my internet or the school's internet or the program, there's too many variables. I want to make sure you, uh, you're covered here. All right, so let's look at a classic psoriatic lesion right here. Um, this is a plaque that's got very strong borders. It's not a lichenification. People get lichenifications and plaques mixed up. And if it's a more mature lesion, you typically have some white, silver white color in it. Uh, here's one, uh, another one that's maybe not as mature, or maybe it's just been treated and these kind of silver's coming out of it. 
Here's some more. Here's a new one popping up right now. And here's a pretty mature one there. Okay, well, that's enough for today. So I hope you enjoyed it, and we will see you in the next video.